Thank you very much, and thank you, Duane, for that very gracious introduction. It is really uh, a, a pleasure and a privilege to be with you all here today. I have sat in those chairs as an alum and as a faculty member, and it's a real pleasure to stand up here and address you as the ninth dean uh, of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, I thought I would uh, spend a little bit of time with you this afternoon telling you how I see the GSB, uh, where we're headed, uh, some challenges we face and some opportunities, and uh, give you a little bit of a sense about how we intend to approach all of that. So uh, I'm a strategy professor. I taught strategy here for 20 years. You can take the professor out of strategy, but you cannot take strategy out of the professor. <laughs> and so I approach the task from the perspective of strategy. I'm no longer, unfortunately, teaching the strategic management class. I am still teaching two sections of critical analytical thinking this quarter. I had 32 students at my house last night in two groups of 16 with dinner wedged in in between, where we discussed who killed the EV1. For those of you who remember the EV1, a little bit of a murder mystery. And we had a number of opinions in the group, a very exciting and engaging conversation. But since I am not teaching strategy, I'm going to do a little bit of strategy of the school with you here today. And uh, I start, uh, as one does, I think, for uh, a great uh, nonprofit institution like this, from the perspective of mission. And I have on the slide the stated mission of the GSB. This isn't a new mission. This is a mission that has been in place for a while, and it is a mission that I certainly ascribe to. And you will see that it has two sides. It has two sides which are complementary. On the one hand, we create the ideas in management that change the way that managers of managed organizations implement management and which spread throughout the world and change the way that management is taught in a variety of places. Now, uh, a shorthand for the first bullet point might be taken to be research, uh, but it's not research per se. Of course, there is research involved, but one of the things that is truly distinctive about the Stanford GSB is that we aggregate all of the research in fields to create new fields and new subfields, which become courses first at the GSB and throughout management institutions in the world. So I could tell you the story of the development of the HR course here, or the strategic leadership course, uh, or what we're doing now in critical analytical thinking, all innovations which take place here that emanate from the research of the faculty that become synthesized uh, into fields or subfields, and then change the way that management is taught uh, around the world. Uh, and with those ideas, uh, we create uh, future leaders of managed institutions. And I want to tell you just very briefly how I think about that. Uh, in the MBA program, for two years, uh, we get some of the highest potential students in the world. Uh, we are the most selective school in the world. We still pretty much get our pick of those students. And the question then is what do you do with those, two, those students in those two years? Or in the case of the Sloan program, the students that you get there for a year. And the answer to me is more than you teach them the standard fields of management. It's more than you teach finance and operations and supply chains uh, and so on. Of course you do that. But beyond that, what you do is you take these incredibly high potential individuals and you give them the education, the platform, the motivation, and the aspirations to go out and do really great things. So we, the motto of the GSB is change lives, change organizations, change the world. It's not just a motto, it's a, it's a way of life for us. We take this very seriously. Our aspiration is to take these 380 or 385 students a year that we graduate and to send them out on a life of impact uh, and meaning. And how do you do that? Well, you do that uh, through curriculum, and you do that through the experiences, and you do that through the classmates that you give them to mix with. And I will say a little bit more about those uh, in a little while. So having said a few words about mission, let me say a few words about strategy. When I think about the strategy of the GSB, I start from these four fundamental incredible strategic assets that the Stanford GSB has. Uh, we hire and retain a world-class faculty. I'm convinced we have the best faculty uh, of any graduate school of business. 
Uh, as I said, we get the highest potential students. Uh, we have a tremendous reputation and stature in the world. And not to be minimized on the chart at all uh, are our incredible alumni uh, who, uh, who support the school in a wide variety of ways, uh, who come in and mentor our students, who teach in our classes, who have cases written on them, and who contribute to the school in an enormous number of ways. So these are the four building blocks, I think, for strategy as we move forward. And the links between them are as follows. Starting from the faculty, we do these two parts of the mission that I described, which help to build and reinforce the reputation and stature, and which provide us with a curriculum to deliver to our high potential students, which turns them into principal critical analytical thinkers, people who can de think deeply about management issues and take that facility of mind to the vexing problems that they will encounter in their lives. If we do our job doing that, that creates high impact alumni who do go out and change the world. The alumni, like yourselves, provide tremendous support for the GSB. And the support from, for, uh, for the GSB that you provide and the reputation and stature feed back and enable us to hire and retain a world-class faculty. So that's the essential strategy of the GSB. These are the assets. They're all reinforcing. You can draw, if you like, arrows between almost any of the boxes that are on the chart. Our alumni help us uh, to uh, attract students. Um, the, the faculty, in addition uh, to developing students, um, help, uh, help reinforce the uh, relationships with alumni. There are a whole set of feedback loops uh, in the chart that make for a very coherent and tight strategy. I also wanted to share with you, having done mission and strategy, next on the strategy professor's list is values. I don't want to share with you very briefly. I'm not going to go through them, but to give you a sense of the values that the dean's office is trying uh, to internalize and, uh, and live by. So this is an exercise, not that we went through as a school, but that my new team in the dean's office went through over the summer, asking ourselves, how do we want to be perceived by the constituencies that we interact with? So that that could help us define for ourselves how we wanted to behave on a day-to-day -day basis. And you see, the, you see the results up here starting by building a rich intellectual environment. Um, experimentation and innovation is the core of the GSB's DNA. Uh, promoting a spirit of consultation with, uh, with all our stakeholders. Uh, and rewarding hard work. Uh, my, team, uh, my team likes to work hard. I like to work hard. We believe that work uh, is noble and good in itself in addition to the results that it produces. And we want to be part of a community that internalizes that value. So let me uh, step back then and, uh, and tell you a few other things I hope to cover with you briefly this afternoon uh, in terms of the agenda of the Dean's Office going forward. Firstly, job one is to strengthen and deliver on the three Cs, curriculum, campus, and collaboration. Uh, we have tremendous momentum in all three of these, and it is vital that we don't take our eye off that ball. The job on them is not done. We have to finish that, and that is our initial focus going forward. At the same time, we do have some opportunities to do some new things. I'll discuss with you some of the things we're looking at uh, in that regard. Of course, along with opportunities come challenges. I will share, you, share with you uh, some of the things that keep a new dean awake at night. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit in a much broader context about the future. Where do, where do I think uh, we're headed? And I'll conclude by saying, a little about how you can help us uh, in this endeavor. Uh, before leaving this slide, I, I must say I was, I was tempted to call this uh, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. <laughs> you can see the something old and the something new. Um, you can see uh, the blue in this blue sky piece on the future. But at Stanford, we don't borrow so, uh, because we innovate. And so that, that's where the analogy broke down. So let's talk very briefly about strengthening and delivering on the three Cs. 
Uh, we are in the process of uh, doing an assessment of the new curriculum. We're calling this the new curriculum 2.0. Uh, the first year students felt like beta uh, testers of a curriculum over and over again. They were good sports about it. We formed a committee over the summer uh, chaired by Huggy Rao, the Rao committee, to do an audit of the new curriculum. And having been through one complete cycle and starting with our third group of first years coming through, to ask ourselves frankly what is working, what isn't working, and for the things that aren't working, which of those are fixable, and which of them deserve a short celebration uh, before we move on <laughs> and go in a different direction. I would say overall that the broad structural elements of the new curriculum are working very well. Uh, putting perspectives, a general management approach in the fall quarter before you go to foundations, which was very controversial when we proposed it, has in fact gone very, very well. Uh, introducing leadership skills training into the fall quarter, uh, culminating in the executive challenge is another huge success, uh, I think, for the new curriculum. The idea of having not just one level of classes, but a level of classes with advanced application classes that students can uh, be selected into depending on their background experience so that not every student has to go through the same basic foundational courses has really served to challenge some of our better students. Uh, and I think we're pleased with the concept, uh, although the implementation is not quite there in all cases. Now, the second bullet point I will have to say uh, is, uh, is for me the most unexpected positive surprise. Um, uh, we put in place a global experience requirement which requires that every one of our students goes abroad to a country where they did not grow up and where they've not had a significant amount of work experience and that most of them do that in their first year. Um, and I was not surprised that when they went out uh, in study trips or in summer internships and had these experiences, that they were individually enormously enriched by them. Uh, I, I strongly suspected, having been on a number of study trips, that that would be the case. But the thing that I had not really anticipated was the impact of what happens when they come back. Because when they come back, they share what they've learned with all of their classmates. And so if you're sitting in a class uh, discussing uh, any issue that any faculty member might bring up, you now have somebody who can say, well, I was just in Brazil, uh, and I don't see how this would apply in Brazil. And somebody else will say, well, I was just in China, and I see how it might apply in China, and here's why. Or I was in India, or I was in Ghana, or I was in the Philippines, or I was in Thailand. Uh, all places I've been with students in the last three or four years. And so that bringing into the classroom of their global experience has itself globalized the curriculum and the culture and the experience at the GSB. Final thing I want to touch on is this course on critical analytical thinking, which uh, I, with an army of faculty, are teaching this quarter. We teach these courses in sections of 16. So there are 24 sections. That means there are about 15 full professors teaching this class. Uh, there is no more fun, it turns out, than getting together with 15 of your full professors from across the field uh, and arguing about what the answer to the topic of the week is. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's one of those rare, rare occasions where the OB faculty and the finance faculty and the strategy faculty and the OIT faculty uh, are, uh, are all in the same room. And uh, if you're talking about something like culture, uh, the OB faculty will have a certain perspective on culture and the finance faculty will say, what is culture? <laughs> It makes for a lively discussion. <laughs> uh, we do have some challenges. Uh, some of the courses are not going yet as well as we would like. Uh, some of those we'll continue to persevere with. Others, I think, we will uh, declare, uh, declare victory on and, uh, and move on. Um, the other big challenge we have, which is entirely the, the fault of the, uh, of the task force that came up with the curriculum, uh, which I chaired, so I take responsibility for it, uh, is my committee was extremely good at, uh, at addition and not so good at subtraction. So we added courses and we took nothing out. <laughs> and uh, the consequence of that is there's just, there just too many required units. Uh, and what we thought at the time was we would defer some of the courses to the second year. Uh, it turns out to be very, very difficult to teach required classes and electives side by side. So that's not working that well and uh, we're going to have to take a look at that 
in the next few weeks. So that's the curriculum, by and large, uh, I think going, uh, going very well, but some, some tweaking necessary uh, at the margin. Uh, second C, of course, is the campus. Tremendous progress. Uh, I wish I could say we were brilliant about it, but regardless of how we did it, we did exactly the right thing, which is we put together the resources to build the campus during the boom, <laughs> and now we're building it during the recession. Uh, you will be surprised what happens to costs uh, during a uh, during recession. So we, uh, we have managed to get some, some good cost savings, and I acknowledge uh, Dan Rudolph, who, uh, who is in, in charge of that, that part of the organization and is with us here today. We are on track to be LEED Platinum certified, the highest level uh, of sustainability for a campus, and we're building a campus which is designed for innovation and collaboration that is flexible and that reflects our value and the uniqueness of the GSB. Uh, and now the critical next step is to make sure that we live that. Uh, and that's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that because a building uh, and a campus has the potential and flexibility for collaboration and for engagement that that necessarily happens. And we are going to spend the next year actively involved with our faculty, staff, um, our students, all our, all our stakeholders to make sure that we build a camp, not that we build a campus, but that when we move into the campus that it has the energy and dynamism and life uh, that we all hope, uh, hope that it would have and that it supports our mission and culture. I'm not going to talk very long about collaboration. I will just say that I think we are just at the tip of the iceberg on potential opportunities for us to interact with the schools on, on the rest of the campus. Uh, we do have a number of joint degree programs. Uh, I believe we should have more. Uh, we also need to simplify uh, the, the, the requirements and, and methods by which students move across the schools, and we're working on that. Uh, we do have a number of tremendous success stories of courses that have span boundaries. And unfortunately, although this is a, a favorite subject of mine, uh, I don't have the time this afternoon to go into all of them in great detail. However it turns out, and I've tried this several times, uh, it is impossible for me to go through the slide uh, without talking about Jim Patel's course on extreme affordability, uh, because I love the course. And, and let me just tell you, for those of you who don't know it, a little bit about this course. So this is a course um, that resides in the D School. That is a, the course is collaborative, including students from a variety of different schools. So there'll be business school students, uh, engineering school students, sometimes law, education, medicine. And what these students will do is they'll get on a plane with Jim and they will go to a developing country and they will meet with people who face specific challenges in day-to-day -day life in these countries. So they start by talking to the eventual consumers and seeing what their problems and challenges are. And then they come back to the D School and using the tremendous resources and technical knowledge that this university has, they ask themselves, how can we solve these problems? And not just how can we solve these problems, but how can we solve these problems in a way that will enable us to deliver the final product to the end consumer at a price that they can afford with a supply chain and distribution that matches the reality of the country in which these products are going to go. It's an unbelievable challenge. I'll give you one very quick example. Uh, they, one of the problems they encountered is when they went into rural African villages, they discovered that the doctors or nurses in these villages had no incubators. I wouldn't have helped them if they had incubators because they have either no electricity or intermittent electricity. Right? So what do you do? Well, it turns out that what you do is you design something which is basically a small sleeping bag, a little sleeping bag for the infant. And if any of you have gone skiing and you've, you've used that stuff where you, you, know, you break a, a little pack and then it warms up your hands, you take essentially a liquid like that, you put it in a transparent bag, and uh, you, the, the, the mom takes the bag, throws it in a pot of boiling water. When it achieves a, a temperature which will keep the sleeping bag warm, it changes color. You then take it, drop it in the back of the pouch where there's a transparent window, and it will maintain the temperature in the sleeping bag at the required level, just as an incubator which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars would do, for five hours. <laughs> At which point, the color changes, the mom takes it out, drops it back in the boiling water, and off you go. 
This thing can be produced and delivered to the end user for $25. So that's, that's the kind of thing I think you get when, when you combine the kind of expertise that our students have with the engineering know-how, medical know-how, maybe it's legal know-how, educational know-how that exists at this great university. And when we say collaboration, that's what it is that we're trying to achieve by opening ourselves up uh, to our sister schools on campus. Let me say a little bit about looking forward, uh, some opportunities and challenges. Uh, we've looked, uh, as I said, long and hard at our MBA curriculum. We think it's time uh, to take a look now at our Sloan program, our 10 and a half month full-time program, uh, which has not really undergone a, a major revamp in quite a while, and we're going to do that uh, this year. Uh, we're also looking uh, at a couple of ways to extend the, the amount of impact that the managerial insight that we're building, uh, in, uh, that our faculty are building, uh, and, and getting some leverage from that in a couple of, uh, of new venues. So we're thinking about a, an annual a campus event to showcase our managerial insight, and we're looking for ways to take this talent to some, uh, some new areas globally uh, where we can have impact and continue to build uh, the GSB brand. Uh, we are particularly cognizant as, as we do this uh, of the growth in economies like uh, China and India and Brazil, uh, to name a few, and the opportunity that those regions we think present uh, in the future. Uh, and we think we need to get in early and, uh, and put a stake in the ground and build some brand uh, in those regions. And we're going to look at some some ways to do that. Uh, I, leave, uh, I leave for China, actually, on Monday. Uh, along with opportunities, of course, come some challenges. Uh, faculty recruiting and, ch and, and retention is always a tremendous challenge here. One of the, you know, the flip side of having what you think is, is the world's leading faculty uh, is that other, other schools want them. <laughs> and every now and then, they, they come and try to get them. And then we have to try to hold on to them. And uh, if you have 100 of them and other people have fewer than that, uh, they can have a big impact by stealing two or three uh, of your star talent. And that is just an ongoing challenge for us. We're operating in a new financial reality, uh, as, uh, as are many, uh, many of the corporations that our, our students will go into. Uh, I have here to, uh, to really thank and acknowledge uh, Bob Joss, uh, my predecessor. Uh, I say jokingly, but it's actually quite serious that if you're going to take the job I've taken in the environment that you're taking it, uh, and your fairy godmother were to give you three wishes, uh, top of the list would be that your predecessor was a banker. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I had, and, uh, and Bob jumped on this problem, uh, as far as I know, ahead of, uh, of any other educational institution, even ahead of the university. Um, and, uh, and the result was that we made some adjustments early, which is uh, standing us in, in very good stead now, but it is still, uh, it is still a, a challenge. Um, you know, along with that is, is a question of how best to, to leverage our resources. We, we cannot uh, continue to do all the things that we've done with fewer staff than we had, and so we're working through that process of prioritization uh, now. Uh, let me just say very briefly, because uh, I don't have a lot uh, to say about this slide, but on the slide is a set of absolutely tremendous strategic assets which our business school has right now. We are fabulously positioned in a number of regards, and I'll let you read the list for yourselves. And let me just say, and this is the blue sky piece, that I think the challenge for all of us and for you know, the dean's office and the faculty and the staff and the students in conjunction with our alumni uh, is to figure out what we, you know, where we take the school with this tremendous set of, uh, of resources. Of course, you know, strengthening and building our core programs uh, has to be top of the list, uh, but we're sure that there's more to be done uh, to, uh, to leverage these great assets and have greater impact in the two bullets uh, of the mission that I presented earlier. And we look forward to having that conversation with you over the next couple of years as we start to refine our thoughts on it. Finally, uh, how, how, how can you help? Well, first of all, thanks for uh, all you've already done for us. As I said in the strategy slide, the school would not be the school that it is without the tremendous support that we've gotten from our alumni. Uh, you're critical uh, to the school and to the, fundamentally to the strategy uh, of the school. 
Uh, and here are a variety of other ways in which uh, you can continue to help. Stay in touch through the website. Uh, talk the place up. Uh, you know, we're, we're a small school, so we have a small, relatively small network, and uh, we need to amplify our voices uh, out there. Please stay involved, whether it's through lifelong learning or through volunteering. Uh, especially in this economy, one of, the, one of the greatest things you can do for us this year uh, is to hire our graduates. Uh, it's going to be another challenging year. Or tell a friend, uh, or you know, find a way to hook uh, a graduate student up with, uh, with a, an opportunity. Uh, of course, uh, we, we, our model relies uh, heavily on your ongoing uh, financial support. Uh, and then uh, spread the word uh, about our great executive education programs, as that is another uh, tremendously important and also challenged uh, revenue stream for us. And with that, uh, I will stop and I'll take, uh, I'll take a couple of questions uh, on any subject if there are some. Yeah. Supply side economics, and number two, why? If they are. Uh, so the, 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 the easy cop out is that uh, the, the new curriculum no longer has a, has a course on macroeconomics. So, uh, but there are electives on, on macroeconomics. I would say, um, you know, that supply chain economics is, is discussed, but we, our macroeconomists are not supply siders. They're, uh, aspect of what you do was up there, but you didn't comment on it. It's gotten to be pretty substantial since I was here 25 years ago. I, I didn't hear the first part of the question. I'm sorry. Your comments on the entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. And the professors and all that. Question, please. So the question is, I did not comment anywhere here on entrepreneurship uh, at the GSB in our entrepreneurship curriculum. Uh, one, of the, one of the roles I had uh, before taking this job was uh, as one of the directors of the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. Uh, entrepreneurship is now a very central and vital part uh, of the GSB. It is not in the required curriculum, uh, but the, the base level entrepreneurship course, Formation of New Ventures, uh, is now taught each year in five or six sections, which means that almost every student uh, at the school chooses to take it. We have a subsequent course on, uh, on managing growing enterprises, which is taught in five sections. So again, almost every student uh, takes that. Uh, I, didn't, I had the 356 course up there, but I didn't talk about it. That is a two-quarter, uh, you can think of it as a, an, an entrepreneurship lab, a, a business plan development uh, course. That's, a, that's a, a very vital part uh, of the curriculum. So entrepreneurship uh, is a tremendous strength. I'm just, I'm just touching the, the very tip of the iceberg. We have a very robust and rich set of offerings in entrepreneurship in, uh, in the elective curriculum. I'll take one more at the back, yeah. You, it used to be a separate section uh, that you used to teach it. Is it integrated? Yeah, so the question is about, is about public management. Uh, we have uh, a required class in the curriculum on, uh, on non-market strategy. So every student is required to think about uh, the, the non-market segment uh, of the economy. We still have a public management certificate, and uh, a large number of students choose to take uh, enough elective courses to, uh, to, to earn that certificate. But all of this understates a very important phenomenon, which I want to just uh, spend a second on. Uh, we have a, a Center for Social Innovation, like we have a Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. And the reason that we have a Center for Social Innovation is that uh, young people today uh, really have a, a, a tremendous interest and drive to do something for the world beyond, uh, you know, a, a career in a for-profit uh, institution going out and, um, and, and worrying about their own personal um, uh, wealth and career. Uh, a tremendous desire to, to help others and to serve, to change the world in a variety of ways. Uh, this was a phenomenon that, of course, was, was present uh, before President Obama, but it has been fueled by, uh, by that political movement. Um, and so that transcends, uh, you know, anything that we would have done before uh, in the PMP, and it's really uh, a significant part, I think, of the, of the GSB community and culture, and something, I think, quite distinctive uh, for the GSB, something that is now considered when students compare schools as, as an area of relative strength for us. Okay, I said that was the last question. I'll take one more, but then we have to move on. Yeah. Uh, did 
talk about promoting GSB in China, and many of our competitors already have joint program with uh, Beijing University, uh, Fudan University, Tsinghua University in China. Uh, I spent the last couple of years in China, but it, uh, Stanford and GSB have very good reputation, but the network is very small. Can yeah. you tell, talk about what you plan to do and what the alumni can help? Thank you. So the question was about our presence in China, especially given that uh, many of our competitors are in the business of setting up satellites in a variety of places, including uh, including China. What, what I have in mind for China, what I'm going to explore uh, next week, uh, you know, both uh, with, uh, with a couple of, of the most distinguished schools uh, in the country, uh, is some kind of partnership uh, where on a regular basis, maybe it's annually, maybe it's every second year, uh, we jointly showcase our ideas and talent around cutting edge managerial issues. Uh, so we would take out uh, some of our faculty, we would, uh, we would co you know, cooperate with them, bringing in some of their best faculty, and showcase some of what we're doing in a high-profile event that draws in uh, senior government leaders, senior uh, business leaders, of course the media, and gets the word, uh, the word out. Uh, we would use, uh, use those events to also uh, spread the word about, uh, about uh, what we're doing in, in, in other respects. Um, uh, the university is, uh, is, uh, is in discussions and is contemplating uh, uh, actually a physical location at PKU, uh, which would provide us with a possible base for these kinds of activities. Uh, the other kind of thing which you might do once you have the faculty out there, it turns out that a, a large number of our faculty have produced uh, books, textbooks, or, or other managerial books uh, that have been translated uh, into Mandarin. And there's an opportunity then to hold kind of a convocation for faculty at business schools across the country to come in and, uh, and learn from our faculty what is in the books, how we teach them, how we structure the courses, uh, and to really then use that as an opportunity to disseminate uh, the kind of experience that our students uh, have here. So that's, uh, that's the kind of thing we're doing. Um, I, I see that there's still one or two more hands, but um, uh, if I'm not careful, Lynn is going gonna, is gonna to give me the big hook here because uh, we, have, uh, we have a number of other things uh, yet to discuss. And so if you don't mind, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to change gears uh, at this point.